Hi everyone, welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Jennifer Gagnon with the Forest Landowner Education Program at Virginia Tech. And today I'm joining you from my farm outside of Snowville in Montgomery County, Virginia. And this morning I have a special guest with me. My husband, John Peterson, will be taking us on a tree ID walk. So in addition to being Jennifer's husband, I'm also a forester. I've been a research forester for Virginia Tech for 28 years. And uh, in that period of time, I'm one of the developers of the Virginia Tech Dendrology Database. Uh, it's actually been my job to travel around the country with John Seiler taking pictures of trees. Um, in addition to the <coughs> Virginia Tech Dendrology Database, you may also have heard of the VTree app. That's available for iPhone and Android devices. Today, I thought we could focus on trees that are commonly found on limestone soils. Not exclusive, but pretty common on limestone. All right, well, let's yeah. go take a look. So when you abandon farmland here, here in the Appalachians on limestone, one of the main trees to seed itself in, and, and it's almost immediate, you'll get a mix of multiflora rose, autumn olive. This tree is, is also, it's, it's the most common woody tree that will seed itself in. Uh, this is a black cherry. And if we look across the hillside, about half of that hillside is covered up in black cherry. That was a hay field 20 years ago. So now it's a black cherry stand mostly. Coming back over here, black cherry, in addition to being a pretty aggressive pioneer on abandoned hay fields, it can be a really high dollar species. Uh, here in the Appalachians, more of our black cherry looks like this. I mean, this is not a very good timber tree, but it's still a pretty a, a good tree for us to learn. Um, black cherry leaves, they're not terribly descriptive. They, uh, they are long and narrow with a serrated leaf edge and almost everything in the Rosaceae family has a serrated leaf edge. And I'm looking, boy, this is a hard time of year to learn tree ID. Down at the base of these leaves, there should be little glands. Yeah, there's good, that, that's good little glands. So down at the base of the leaves on a cherry tree, you can look for these little glands. They should be there. Moving on from the leaves to the twigs, black cherry twigs are very, very slender. And they'll have a reddish brown twig this is gray brown because it overwintered, but they'll, they will have a reddish brown twig with a reddish brown bud. None of that is very distinctive, but if we take one of these twigs and we smell it, and if you have terrible sense of smell, you can chew it up. The black cherry twigs have a strong bitter almond flavor. It's, it's almost like an amaretto. So cherry flowers are just about done right now. This time of year, they're starting to fall. The petals are falling off. They're drying up, changing into fruits. Here are some cherry flowers that are still hanging on. And like everything in Rosaceae, the little flowers have five white petals. I say almost everything in Rosaceae. Five little white petals. So... When people talk about evergreens here in Virginia, this one doesn't usually come to mind, right? People think of Virginia pine and white pine, and if you live in the eastern part of the state, loblolly pine. But this evergreen, this is, this is eastern red cedar, is so common on, on limestone soils that I, I can't walk by it without talking about it. Um, eastern red cedar, uh, you can find it growing all over the state. It's really a tough tree. It can grow in a lot of different places. This thing is so easy to identify. If we look closely at the leaves, they are a scale-like leaf, and they're little paired overlapping scales. Uh, and, they, and they can actually have two forms. All right, They can have a very scale-like leaf, and they can also have an awl like leaf, like an awl tool for punching leather. So scale leaves and all leaves. 
A W L, not A L L. Uh, Eastern red cedar, when they're young, they will have a red brown scaly bark. All right, that's a nice young bark right there. And as they get older, they develop furrows and the bark will look very fibrous. They become gray and fibrous as they get older. What do we get from Eastern red cedar? Well, first off, how big do they get? Eastern red cedar commonly get to be about that big in diameter, maybe a little bit bigger than that. The wood inside is actually very rot resistant. Uh, it's usually a very pretty dark red, almost a purple color in the heartwood. The sapwood is white, the heartwood is this dark red color. And it's known for making cedar chest. All right, this is the species that we get cedar chest from. Nice one to look out for, easy to identify. Looking across the way, the dark conical tree on the edge of the field, that's eastern red cedar. The fruits on an eastern red cedar, they are actually a cone. They look just like a berry. In fact, they're called incorrectly juniper berries. They're juniper cones. These are not quite mature yet, but you'll get an idea for, they'll get a little bigger. You get a definite idea for the color and ballpark size. They are covered in a, in a dusty, waxy bloom. And if we pull one of these off, one of these cones, and we pop it in our mouth, don't be afraid to do that. Pop a cone in our mouth and chew it up. That's a familiar flavor. That's actually what they use to flavor gin. So you might recognize it from that. So I said earlier that when you abandon a hayfield, when you walk away from a hayfield here, one of the first trees to seed into that hayfield is cherry, at least here in the Appalachians. That's one of our first invaders into an old field. <clears throat> the other tree that's super common on an old limestone hayfield is black walnut. Right, this is the black walnut. Black walnut has a compound leaf that with, let's say, more than 10 leaflets per leaf. Each one of these is a leaflet, all right? The central structure, that central stalk, we'll call that a rachis, okay? That central stalk. And in the fall, which you'll often have, these leaflets will all fall off that central stalk or rachis. And you can actually look around on the ground and find these old rachises, rachii, rachii, whatever, still laying on the ground from last year, okay? Walnut has a very fragrant leaf, and if we take this and crush it up, I wish I could, I wish I could share this with you. They're, they're a spicy, sweet scent when you crush the leaf. Twigs on walnut are as distinctive as the leaves. Not surprisingly, Something that has a big compound leaf like that probably has a large twig to support that big compound leaf. Now these twigs on this particular branch, this is growing down here mostly in the shade. So this is actually small for walnut, but you still have an idea for the detail. It's a big twig. If we can get a look at where that leaf used to be attached, where last year's leaf used to be attached, we call that a leaf scar. Walnuts have a monkey face leaf scar. The leaf scar where last year's leaf was attached that fell off and made that monkey face. All right. Buds. Unfortunately, I don't have any buds to show you now. I told you this was a hard time of year to learn tree ID. The buds have already grown out. And the buds on a walnut are, they're really distinctive. <clears throat> they're a fuzzy, pale tan. And if you look close, you can actually see the little leaves folded together on themselves. They're a fuzzy, tan, naked bud. If all of that is not enough, walnuts have what we call a chambered pith. It's not a solid pith. It's broken up into little rooms. That's called a chambered pith. So walnut flowers, 
I mean, they're on there now or almost done right now. Uh, they're not terribly showy walnut flowers, but they do ripen up into a fruit that you probably have seen before. That's our native walnut fruit right there. And in the fall, these things are covered in a big, thick green husk. If you pick these up out of your driveway, your hands will turn dark brown, almost black from that dye, all right? That dye, that used to be used to dye Civil War uniforms. One side, we won't say which, you figure it out. Um, so if you can get that husk out, Inside there, the nut inside that husk, the nut looks just like this, maybe like a brain. And uh, man, these are actually delicious. If you ever get a chance to try these, they are really tasty. Get a strong nutcracker because they are thick, they're thick walled, but flavorful. Um, the walnuts that you buy in a store, those are English walnuts, which is actually like a from, from the foothills of the Himalayas. I don't know why it's English walnut. But anyway, that's that's our native and delicious black walnut. How big do they get? Black walnut do get to be a timber tree. And uh, they, they can get quite sizable, right? When they get large, the bark can turn gray. It'll weather to gray. When they're not growing fast in diameter, they weather gray. But if we break off the ridges on this, you can see inside that gray, they are a beautiful, like, like dark chocolate or milk chocolate colored inside those weathered gray ridges. This is a black haw. Black haws are really common on limestone soil, but like really, really common on lime. Sadly, we hardly ever notice black haw because they flower at a time of year when they are so thoroughly upstaged by dogwood. Black haws have, when they're flowering, and they're done now, they, they flower at about the same time as flowering dogwood. Flowering dogwoods, of course, everybody recognizes those with, with their big white, they're actually bracts on a dogwood. I don't know if you knew that, they're bracked. They're a modified leaf. But these things, they're more of a cream color than I think equally beautiful. They have clustered flowers in umbrellas. So there's clustered umbrella-shaped flowers. How about umbrella-shaped clusters of flowers? That's phrased correctly. And uh, the, these flowers, we still have, we have a little remnant here of the flower structure. Uh, those flowers will eventually turn into fruits. Okay, and these fruits, they mature in the fall. They will be blue-black when they're ripe. And there's a, there's a good one, there's a good set of them right there. These fruits, this is also called a wild raisin. They're delicious, one of the best kept secrets in the woods. They do have a big pit. So when you're popping them in your mouth to chew them up, be careful, don't lose a tooth. They do have a big pit, best kept secret in the woods. Now the leaves and the twigs, they're very distinctive on a black haw. They are oppositely arranged, okay? So the leaves are opposite each other. There's a little pair of leaves right there. The leaves are opposite each other. And because buds arise in the axles of the leaves, the buds are opposite each other. And when those buds grow out next year, the twigs are opposite. So this has maybe the most strongly opposite structure you can find in the woods. All right, so clearly opposite. The leaves, I mean, they're oval, really not terribly exciting leaves with a finely serrated leaf edge. But the distinctive thing about these leaves is down at the base, they have a purple petiole. The petiole is a leaf stalk. So oval leaves, serrated leaf edge, and a purple petiole. And they are displayed opposite each other. Black haw bark starts out smooth and gray, but when they get older, you can see the mature bark down near the base, they get finely blocky, and that's pretty distinctive. That and flowering dogwood, they have, they have finely blocky bark. 
All right, well, that concludes today's tree walk. Thank you all for coming and visiting with us on the farm. Thanks for spending 15 minutes in the forest with me. Thank you all for watching. And be sure to join us next Friday when Adam Downing will teach us about Femmelschlag. So join us to learn what that word means and find out how you can use it to improve hardwood management on your property. Have a great weekend.